Welcome everybody, thank you for joining us here on the Infinite Prosperity Podcast. My name is Louisa Havers and I help high achievers, entrepreneurs and coaches lift the lid on life and business so that they can live at their highest value. Each episode we will bring you our favourite founders, CEOs and guest experts to share with you their insights and strategies to expand your wealth consciousness, your spiritual leadership and aligned business strategies. We know that living in alignment with your soul's mission is what fulfills you and we are here to show you how to achieve this in an energetically aligned way. If you haven't already, be sure to claim your free abundance activation in the Akashic Records. Go to louisahavers.com forward slash gift to unlock your abundance activation today. And if you'd like my support in having aligned success in life and business, then contact me at www.louisahavers.com and let's explore together if it's an aligned match. Get ready to live at your highest value and to expand into your next level of money as you elevate and receive more. You create more for others. Righty ho, let's dive into today's episode. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Infinite Prosperity Podcast. I'm so excited we have the incredible Steve Hostet back with us for her second appearance on our show. So a huge welcome, Steve. Thank you for having me. Oh, and for those of you that are yet to meet Steve, you'll see in a moment why I'm so excited to have this conversation with her. Siv is a speaker, an expedition leader, an author whose philosophy is to inspire and motivate people to dream big in their life. Now, she survived Nepal's 2015 major earthquake. Resilience and determination led her back to the Everest, making her the first Norwegian woman to climb Mount Everest from the Nepali side. Amazing. And after working intensively in corporate culture, she suffered severe burnout, which made her sick for years. And both her illness and earthquake experience made her reevaluate what's important in life and Ziv has just had an incredible life and made many expeditions uh, since then and is recently back from an incredible trip where she was for 45 days solo in Antarctica. Ziv, welcome. Thank you. (laughs) So for those of our listeners who are getting to know you, just tell us a little bit more about what led you to doing what you do today so they can get a sense of, of who you are. Yeah, and and it's a little bit like people think I'm crazy doing what I do, but I'm just an ordinary girl that loves to hang with friends and and I actually don't even like the cold, so it's kind of... (laughs) (laughs) But um, I just, you know, ended up climbing, or actually I did the Inca Trail in Peru, and uh, from there i just felt so at home in the mountains so i just wanted to do more and more expeditions and ended up climbing the highest peak on every continent and i'm on a journey to go to both the south and the north pole so uh what is called explorers grand slam is to climb the highest peak on each continent and to uh yeah ski basically to both poles and today it's only 70 people in the whole world who's done that. So, so. <laughs> your name's going to be up there. <laughs> yeah, I want to be one of those people. <laughs> yeah, that's incredible. Yeah. I love how your your expeditions really do help people well, be inspired with how they can apply what you learn whilst you're out there facing the weather, all the the challenges that can come from the expeditions that you do and how you can then apply it to leadership and 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 to business and I know that you are just recently back or fairly recently back from your latest trip do tell us tell us what was that trip so that everyone can kind of get a sense of what 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 you were doing why you were doing it what you were up against I was gonna ski kite it's like the kites people use when they're on the water as well but with skis so from the East Antarctica to the South Pole. And it's a challenging route. It's actually the route that most people give up on. Uh, And it's almost double as long as the route that most people that do a full length expedition do. But it's like several reasons why we, actually I say we wanted to do that because I was supposed to go with an expedition partner. And we had planned everything and just 10 days before we were supposed to leave in the beginning of November, our major sponsor pulled out and said they wanted to wait a year and we're like, 
what? <laughs> <laughs> I had my whole living room full of expedition gear and food and preparations were so fully on, you know? So that was like a major slap in the face. And uh, because my expedition partner, he's a musician, professional musician. So he's been without work for a couple of years now because of everything. So for him to just take some money from his bank was not really an option. And for me, I was thinking, you know, I've been putting off three months of my life to go to Antarctica and I just don't want to wait a year. I don't know what's going to happen within a year. Maybe there's another t- reason why we can't go or whatever. Mm-hmm. So I was thinking, I'm just going to do it. So I decided to go on my own. Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah. and uh, people are like what you can't go on your own and I was like why can I not go on my own you know because there are several men who's done that before why couldn't I do it uh, but I actually got a lot of resistance on that uh, the company we were supposed to go with uh, refused to take me when I was the solo woman oh, um, wow. so I had several discussions with them and and um uh, Everything that was fine when we, there were the two of us was suddenly now very dangerous and all kind of other reasons that I felt was basically bogus reasons for not letting me go. So I was like thinking, you know what? I have the plane ticket. Let me just go to South Africa. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so I did. And I showed up in their office and tried to get an agreement, but they like, no. No, no, no. <laughs> so uh, I tried several times. I think I tried like six times and got no every time. And I was like, oh my God, you know, am I going to give up on my goal? Or, you know, so I was thinking, okay, there is one other opportunity. There is one other company. Let me just go and talk to them. And they're like, yeah, we can make this happen. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I got a later start than originally because it took time to, you know, convince people that a solo woman can do this. And it would have been the first time a woman had had gone from that part of Antarctica to the South Pole. So um, that in itself was something, you know. Huge. Yeah. Absolutely huge. I loved it when I suddenly saw that you were in South Africa. I was like. What are you doing there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I know where you're going. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is quite something. That, and to have persevered, I think it's a real lesson there for everyone when you're talking about the perseverance you had to, already before you've even got there, against all these doors that seemingly were shut. I mean, I do feel that, you know, we hear these incredible stories like with yourself. And I often think of, very successful um, business owners or authors where they'll say Harry Potter was popping into mind Mm -hmm. where wasn't JK Rowling rejected like lots and lots of times I don't know how many 15 times or whatever and then one publisher the final publisher that she went to opened the door and suddenly you know the rest is history and it feels like that you were up against that those are people just for whatever reason suddenly saying it was too dangerous just because you're a woman on your own was that was that it that they were saying those were the reasons why yeah they even told me that um it will be too expensive if I had to have a rescue with the plane and I was like that plane is not going to cost more money if I'm on my own than if I went with my business expedition partner and it was okay two weeks ago, you know? Yes. <laughs> it's like, excuse me, I don't understand this. Can you explain it? But they didn't want to explain it, you know? Of course, because they couldn't. Mm. Yeah. Oh, wow, that's quite something, isn't it? That doesn't make any any sense at all. So what happened then after you managed to finally, against all the resistance, how, how were you like emotionally from, because that's quite a battering having... Everybody's saying no, no, no. And you're like, come on, I just want to get to the just want to get to that pole. I was really sad for at, at one point because I felt like I really, really wanted to do this and I couldn't really understand why why I couldn't go, uh, why I met all of this resistance. Uh, of course we all know the 
patriarchal system that's been around for thousands of years and and i felt like i was like hitting my head up against that and and i think like you said with a lot of entrepreneurs and and founders of, of companies we do meet obstacles and you just have to just don't give up you know mm -hmm. And, and I was at the point where I was thinking, okay, if I'm not going to be able to do this, I'm just going to stay here for a month in South Africa. And and I was on, come to an agreement with myself that I would be okay with that too. Mm -hmm. But of course, when that the door swung open, I was like running for it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming for you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. How long did it take to so to get to the the sort of beginning of get down to Antarctica so you could start the expedition and start to go like go alone? Well, the good thing is that it sounds like I just decided and then I'm going. You know, actually, I've been planning this for several years, mm -hmm. so uh, I already have the plan for the food and 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 all of that in place, but. It's still a lot of agreements that needs to be made and the logistics with the food and packing and preparations. So basically I signed the final paper on the contract at the check-in desk at the airport as we left, because I only had 10 days from they said, uh, let's check if we can do it. Then two days later, they came back and said, yes. Uh, so I had like eight days to like doo -doo -doo, prepare it. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you got to pack food for actually I pe packed food for some extra days, which I was really grateful for later. Uh, and uh, yeah, have everything in day packs with breakfast, lunch, dinners, you know, uh, all of that. Calculate the number of liters of fuel you need for cooking and for melting water, all of that. Gosh. Um, tell us what was it like then from you know the the moment that you kind of finally set off this dream that you've been working towards for so many like you said so many years and finally you're on that path to do it did you have any sense that there were going to be additional hurdles along the way what was your kind of um feeling about the trip when you finally got there and was set I was going to say set sail I don't know what the term is set off <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You know, it felt like it was really in flow until I got to like my starting point. Uh, they dropped me off there and it was like, it was kind of an incredible moment because there is three guys that actually drove me to the starting point. Uh, and I was like, I haven't really known them for many hours. So I just briefly talked to, to two of them and I was like giving them a big hug. <laughs> it's like, it's going to be the last people I see in weeks, you know? So. It was like a special moment when they laughed and, and I was like, okay, now it's really real. I'm here and, and I'm on my own, you know? Wow. But I, the night before flying out, I didn't sleep at all because it was so many things to prepare because you need to double check your route, the, the, yeah, to have that ready 100% that I need to all my devices to charge them, to try to charge my battery, to, to have everything like ready, you double check and you check again, you know, it's it's so much. Uh, and the challenges in South Africa is that several times a day, they don't have power. Which of course. You, you can't for two and a half hour, you without power. And then uh, again, also Wi-Fi, you know? So it's like, okay, now I just <laughs> have to wait until I can continue charging my stuff and, you know, yeah. So, so all that part was challenging, but um, when I was there ready to, to start the kiting, I had to prepare my sled because mm -hmm. you transport it. You don't have the, um, the things that you attach to your body on the sled. You, so I had to do some preparations when I got there and then the wind died. Oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> like, okay. Yeah, so no long wind. I'll just pitch up my tent and have a sleep, you know? Oh, gosh. That was like day one. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Antarctica. Yeah. The unknown. Yeah. <laughs> wow. And then what was, it, what was it like as you kind of went on that journey? I mean, I just am amazed around having 45 days on your own. Yeah. 
is just incredible. Were you able to communicate at all with, yeah. you, with the outside world? A satellite device where I can send small text messages, like 160 characters. So it's like the old fashioned cell phones that we had in the old days. <laughs> Back in the day, you went old school, Sue. <laughs> yeah. So, so I had uh, one guy that sent me the weather forecast every morning. And also every evening by, before eight o'clock, I had to send a message and say, green, I'm good, you know. Uh, we had like a code green for good, yellow for like so-so and red for absolutely no good. I need help kind of thing. So because if, if I didn't get the message, they will follow up with me for... 12 hours and if still not getting in touch they will put the plane in the air within 24 hours to look for me wow so that's a good safety thing to have and and that little device that i had with me is also i gave a link to people so they can actually see where my location was so they can just go online and it's like okay she's there um, so, so for my family, that's good because they can just see, okay, she's moving. She's probably good, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, that must have been very reassuring for, for them because being able, not for them as well, not having that contact with you is, is, a, is an emotional journey for them too. Yeah. Uh, whilst you're doing all the hard work, but. <laughs> no. yeah, but I was there over Christmas and New Year's and, and I had a satellite phone, but it costs a fortune to call with them. So. And you also want to save it for an emergency. So I don't really call a lot, but on Christmas Eve, I called. And I think like my mom, she, she had troubles with me being there, you know. But for me, I didn't really feel the, I hadn't felt the Christmas vibe or the feeling that it was Christmas. And so I, I, I was okay, actually. Much mm. more than the people at home, I think. Yeah, probably. Yes, because I guess there's no Christmas tree around you to kind of go, this is this moment in time, and your brain immediately then knows what the sorts of things your family are doing, don't they? Yeah. And also in South Africa, they didn't have like Christmas songs at the mall or anywhere. So it wasn't really, I didn't get into that vibe before going in. So so um, that, I think, was helpful for me. Mm. Not so yeah amazing what's been your sort of takeaway then from like you you said you know you've had all these safety mechanisms in place and you set off what other challenges did you come up come up against whilst you were going on this incredible journey well I had a very big challenge with the weather mm. because uh, in the beginning it was extremely strong winds uh I had three people sending me weather forecasts and none of them were, were correct and <laughs> challenging and, and especially because it was very strong wind gusts you know that was unpredictable and when you're kiting that is basically dangerous so uh i had uh, early on i had because the mountains where i started in the beginning there's mountains and they created like a turbulence as well so i was several times lifted by the kite and then when you have a heavy sled behind you hanging onto you, that is not a good thing, you know? No. Wow. So I was like realizing, okay, here I really need to be careful because at the end of the day, the safety is the most important thing. And um, already on day three, I had like, I was just going to launch my kite and then like a wind gust came from a different direction. It's like, like slam it to the ground and basically i broke a rib and um oh i yeah, hit broke off a little piece on there of the ski binding as well so i was like oops this can actually be quite dangerous with these wind gusts so mm -hmm. i mean uh, breaking a rib is is very uncomfortable painful but it's nothing you can do about it you know you can't even put on a bandage it's not gonna help anything so so I was like, okay, this is like a message. <laughs> Be careful, you know? So I ended up using smaller kites than I normally would have done because I realized that these wind gusts are so strong and unpredictable that accidents can happen and, and I don't want that. Mm. Yeah. 
That's huge. Gosh, so, so much had happened already just in those that first week of setting off. Yeah. It's incredible. How, yeah. how was it? I'm I'm a hermit, <laughs> but 45 days like alone make it in, in Antarctica, in somewhere where you haven't got, you know, Netflix to binge watch or things to distract you from the fact that you are alone <laughs> or, you know, lots and lots of books that you can kind of get through because obviously you had a certain amount that you can things you can carry what what was that like being being solo for that length of time I think like um in the every day when I was out kiting during the day it wasn't a big problem because basically I'm busy the whole day you know um you get up have some breakfast, get dressed, go out and spend the day out kiting. And, and most people will probably assume that when you get in, you can just relax. But then, you know, you have to dry your clothes, you have to boil water. So just to melt all the snow it takes about two hours to get the water that I need, you know. Wow. And you're going to have dinner and try. I try to write some notes every day, you know, how I felt and what have happened that day and, and things like that. So. By the time like 9.30, I was like, it was getting cold inside the tent even. And I was like, okay, I'm ready to just relax, you know. So around 10, probably I went to bed most of the time. Just, yeah. So the day went fast. And then the days where I had um, like a whiteout where I couldn't really see. I think I could see only like 12 meter one of the days. And you can't go out there kiting when it's only 12 meter visibility. Wow, so you just have to stay in the tent mm -hmm. all day. Yeah, and and then I had two days with like a storm. I think it was 20 meters per second or more wind. It's just stay at home, stay safe. <laughs> <laughs> like I had my little tent, what I called my castle. <laughs> <laughs> I had some audiobooks there, and but this wasn't really a big problem to make time pass. Actually, mm. easier than I thought on forehand. Yeah, that that's ama that that's amazing. That having to um, it's being prepared, isn't it, for the unexpected, and then going going with the flow of the unexpected. Yeah, you kind of have to yeah. <laughs> in that situation, <laughs> obviously. Absolutely, and then after New Year's, it changed into not no wind it was like you're kidding me you know <laughs> no, it's been too much and uh, and then it's like no wind is it like, yeah yeah it's wow. very challenging i have to say yeah so how far did you did you get in terms of your 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 journey and progress because i know you wanted to get to the get to the south pole mm -hmm. what happened with that piece of the the, the trip how, how long would it have taken you to get to the South Pole? Well, if the weather would have been good, it would have taken me between three and four weeks. Wow. Uh, but in, it's kind of incredible. I was there for six weeks and not like one full day with good weather for kiting. And that is like, is, is kind of, is it even possible? And, and they said, well, this year was very challenging. There's a lot of it and everybody complained about that. And I was like, well, that was lucky to go that year. Yeah. <laughs> and also my weatherman said, well, and then everybody experienced no wind afterwards after New Year. So it's, it wasn't only me that had the same trouble. But of course, if you're out there skiing, that many people that go to the South Pole, they do cross-country skiing. Uh, then the weather like that is not as challenging as for a kiter because we are dependent on the wind. But I did uh, get uh, 930k, so it I did did a decent distance. Yeah, uh, and I would have gone further, but um, at one point we, I realized that it's going to be a real challenge to actually make it to the South Pole before the last flight out of there because end of january they closed down for winter season is coming down there so i was like thinking it would be a huge risk i could have made it but i could not have made it as well depending on the weather and um as i was there it was a huge surprise to me that the company that did the logistics for me 
they told me there that they couldn't fly beyond 83 degrees and I was like what because they couldn't actually pick me up if I went further than that point and that is information I should have had before heading out if you ask me Mm. that was like a huge surprise which I so if I passed 83 degrees that would have been a major problem if I didn't make it. So I felt like I couldn't really take that risk. Mm. You know? uh, so in the end, they said to me, stop, don't continue. Even though I, I wanted to go to 83 degrees because that would have been a place where they have a fuel depot and it, it wouldn't have been really a big problem for them to pick me up there. Uh, but they said, they were like, no, no, stop here. So I, I followed there. Mm you know, what they wanted. Uh, but in the end, they couldn't pick me up there with the plane. So they the, they were, they had me waiting for like a full week because at their location where the air runway was, it was a storm and the planes couldn't lift off the ground, even though my location was nice weather. Mm. So I was like sitting there waiting, waiting, <laughs> you know. <laughs> And then finally, after a one week, they they were going to go to that fuel depot and pick me up on the way. They came, they did circle a couple of times and left. And I was like, what? And then I got a message. Sorry, pilot don't want to land because of the ground conditions. Uh, we'll get in touch for further information. And I was like, shoot, you know. <laughs> That's quite. How did you feel as you saw the plane coming in and then uh, it disappearing again? It feels like a Hollywood movie, Siv. Like yeah. I think of <laughs> some I was, action films have had that sort of scene. I was really sad when they left. I, I have to say, it. I cried actually, honestly, uh, because um, I was so happy. I've been there waiting for a full week, not because they didn't want me to continue and not to kite anymore. So long days and then yay they're coming and there's like where where's the plane what happened <laughs> you know uh, yeah and then the realization oh you know, they're not gonna land and they're not coming for me you know that's quite something yeah that's quite something it's like a not only a physical challenge but such an emotional challenge to to go on this this expedition yeah absolutely yeah what's been the you know as you it's it's kind of early days isn't it as you you know have come back and I'm sure there's more contemplation time for you as you move forward but so far what what has been your kind of takeaway from from the trip and lessons for for life for leadership for business I just feel there's so much in your experience absolutely and and um I think one of the things that I only realized like last week is that I I was at a hotel and I was going to the restaurant there and when I came in there I was like oh my goodness I can't stand it I have to, I have to go out it's too noisy mm. because I've been in the quiet for such a long time and now I noticed the noise and the volume of some of that and I think that we we don't realize how it's affecting us like in every day mm. So, so for even for people to consciously try to be in a quiet place, it's actually very good for our body. So, and also if you're going to, you know, be a strong leader to not have all that noise going on and disturbing your whole day, you know, I think mm-hmm. that's, uh, that's profound. And I, I didn't even realize how it's affecting me until I noticed now that I came back, you know. So that's one of the things, but also just not giving up on our dreams, you know, even though it's not happening. I know that I'm capable of reaching the South Pole. I was strong. I was healthy. I didn't have any issues. It was just the weather and I can't control the weather, unfortunately. So I just had to live with that. Um, So it's, I think that we just have to give it another go yes when is the other go when are you going to do it again then so <laughs> i'm not sure probably not this year 
<laughs> I think I want to go to feed your summer warm first. <laughs> Fiji is lovely. I have been there. I highly recommend it. <laughs> and would you go alone again, Ziv? Or would you, are you going to, you know, buddy up with your partner again? I think I'm going to buddy up with my partner because I actually love to work in a team. Mm. And uh, yeah, so I know that I can do it on my own, but it doesn't mean that I will. Yeah. Because I love building a strong team and, and helping each other and lifting each other and all of that. Being able to share the experience as well. Like, you know, yeah. I've broken my rib to be able to say that to somebody yeah. that yeah. you're with or look at that over there or isn't it amazing? You know, I think it's just so special to be able to share share the experience. Yeah. And one of the things that I really love with going on these expeditions is to share the journey. And I do that in my talks, but also to show pictures and stuff like that. And I actually started today to put out a picture on Instagram to actually start sharing some of the things, because most people will never, ever go to these locations and, and to share and yeah, to mm -hmm. let people know how it looks like and how it is. That's some of the things that I want to do. Oh, thank well, thank you for sharing that. I'm live I'm living, you know, these expeditions through you. <laughs> so this is my my adventure is like <laughs> getting to experience them through you. So I'm so so grateful. So tell everybody, um, you know, how can people get in touch with you, follow you? Where where are you hanging out? You mentioned Instagram. Where else can people find you? I have my web page, uh, so they can actually use my name, sieveharstad.com, um, and they will find me there. Um, oh. And yeah, so it's uh, a few things that I do. I actually help people with like the mindset because, um, yeah, leaders need that, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, and I've been through the journey. I've been a leader myself in corporate and um, this experience, not being able to reach my goal. I had that when I went for Everest in 2015 and experienced a massive earthquake, you know? <laughs> oh, yes, twice you've had this experience where you've put your heart and soul into something and then, yeah, not hit the, not hit the goal because of things that have happened outside of your control. Yeah. That's huge. What what are the 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 uh, you know your 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 reflections on the lessons from that? Because I think that there's so many people that probably listening to this podcast that recognize that experience. They're like, why is this not happening? <laughs> or whatever whatever's going on in their leadership journey. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that for from the 2015 earthquake, my lesson was like, you never know what's going to happen. Don't wait. Because a lot of people are like, oh, I'm going to do it when I retire or they're waiting for this and that or for their friend to join or whatever is the reason why they were waiting. But I understood that there and then that things can change like that. You know, if you have the opportunity, if you have a dream, if you have a goal, go for it, you know. And, and I think like also this time, I feel a little bit like maybe it wasn't the right timing with the weather and and i also have learned over the years now recently that um i will get there it's going to be the right time maybe a little bit later mm. and and that's going to be fine and you're never the same person going back you're bringing all that experience that you've learned from this expedition back to that next experience. you get to go twice <laughs> It's, it's a little bit to trust the journey as well, mm. because like you said, I have the, I have improved my skills with being there and, and learned so much. I'm going to be very efficient when I go back, you know? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love it. I love it. I'm so excited for you and for all your future expeditions. So after Fiji and a uh, hot country... <laughs> um what what other expeditions have you got coming coming up south pole any others on the horizon yeah actually we have the north pole very short horizon um yeah there's been some challenges with uh, with our main sponsors the guys that pulled out 
So right now we're doing what we can to try to pull it together. And if so, we're going in April. In oh my word, that's so exciting. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. exciting. Where can we follow your trip to the North Pole then? Is that on your Instagram page or on, yeah. the, on the website? And, and also on my web page, I'm probably going to have like I had now like a blog where I update how it goes. Uh, so that's possible to follow there. And also then that's going to be like a three week expedition skiing. And uh, after that, I'll go to Papua New Guinea sometime this year, climb the highest volcano in the Oceania. <laughs> As you do. Oh, I love it. <laughs> yes. well, Siv, thank you so much for coming and sharing your experience and the incredible lessons that you know you've taken away and learnt and to be able to share those with us so that we can see how we can apply this to our own lives and, and to business and to you know that self-leadership leading ourselves through things when they're not quite going as going as planned yeah. so so grateful for you and for your courage and bravery for getting out there and inspiring us with these with these expeditions thank you and thank you for having me on there show <laughs> oh please do come back again and tell us about the <laughs> about the next one all righty thank you everybody thanks for joining us today looking forward to connecting you all please do come and join us in the money kinesiology facebook group where you can share your reflections on our conversations in our podcast and until next time sending you lots and lots of love namaste thanks for listening to the infinite prosperity podcast and if you like what you've heard and want to know more please go to louisahavers.com we just appreciate you so much. So thank you for listening and hanging out with us. If there's anything that we can do for you, you can email us at louisa at louisahavers.com. Let my team know if you have any ideas for shows that you'd love to hear or topics you want me to talk about. Really looking forward to hearing from you. All right, that is it for this week, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for today. Looking forward to connecting with you again. Until next time, namaste.